Welcome everybody. And um, yeah, this is the first one of these kind of hybrid lectures in a in a room like this that I've had to put on for a few years. Um, we were all doing face to face and it was great. And then we shut down and online has been fine. The hybrid seems to be the hardest thing to get right because we've got to like have all this extra tech. But hopefully everyone online can see me and the camera's going to follow me around. If it doesn't, let me know in the chat. Um, uh, come on, track me, you stupid thing. All right, if it doesn't, oh yeah, it's working. Um, all right, so welcome to Aero Structures. Some of you, this will be your first um, Aero class of your degree, which should be pretty exciting. Um, I get to see you on Monday, first thing, so I get to kind of fill your mind with all the things that Aero related um, before anyone else does. Uh, we're going to just jump straight into it uh, and we'll go over a bit of the course outline stuff. The first week is a bit of frame setting, like we call it like aer aer uh, aero structures basics. It's kind of getting around what the forces on an airframe are, how it stays in the air. I don't touch anything aerodynamics really. Well, actually there's two slides that are a little bit aerodynamics-y. I'm really focused on just overall forces on the airframe and how we go about working out the internal stresses and strains and whether the airframe is going to fall out of the sky. So we'll start with the course outline and we'll go, I'll go through things that um, like what we're going to learn and how it all connects to the, to the lectures. So the first thing is this understanding of the configuration materials used in the airframe. So that's really the basics module and module um, and the aerospace materials module. So the first maybe four weeks of the course is devoted to this. Uh, analyze aerospace structures using classical analysis techniques. And the way, reason I say classical there is that we're not using numerical analysis. We're not using finite element analysis and stuff in this course. I will allude to it, but um, anything to do with finite element analysis and numerical modeling, we'll, you'll need to take the FEA course. And the last module, which is weeks, 10 or 8, 9 and 10, I think, uh, is to do with the ability to design aerospace structures against failure, degradation, instability and aeroelasticity. So it's analysing the stresses in the structure and then understanding how we actually design the structure to avoid those um, catastrophic failure mechanisms. Uh, and learning outcomes here, I'm not going to go over those because they're basically the same. So. This year, we've got four modules. Um, the previous course outlines looked a little bit different, but basically the first one is week one. Then this one is about two and a half weeks. This one's about, again, another three weeks. And then the last one, three weeks. I don't know if that all adds up. But there's extra, there's extra lectures in the first half to fit these in. Um, and then it, the lecture pace slows down a little bit um, after the break. We're going to talk about forces on the on an aircraft because really all of aerostructures comes down to what forces are on the aircraft and what forces are inside the aircraft and how to make sure the wings don't fall off. Uh, so hopefully coming into third year aero, even though you haven't taken any aero classes, you've seen a diagram like this somewhere in your um, in your past, okay? We, we know that there are four main forces on an aircraft. Uh, lift, which is an aerodynamic force. Uh, drag, which is an aerodynamic force. <coughs> Thrust, which is an aerodynamic force, but it comes from the propulsion system. Um, so we're putting energy in to generate that. And weight, which is what's sticking us to the ground. Gravity is helpful sometimes, but uh, pain when you're trying to fly something in the air. Um, now this is a pretty simplified view of how um, the mechanics of an aircraft work, but helpful in a lot of situations. Um, but we obviously need to go beyond that if we're going to understand like, how aero structures work. Um, just from the equilibrium here, we don't really have a re reaction force or a support for an aircraft. So everything has to be in equilibrium as it stands. Um, so we've got lift, equals weight, thrust equals drag, otherwise the aircraft is accelerating in some way. Um, so in straight and level flight, 
the aircraft is in sitting in equilibrium. And generally, if we want an aircraft that is actually useful, we have to have lift being substantially bigger than drag. Um, so we have to have our drag coefficients low enough that the aircraft is, is not wasting all its power overcoming drag. The next um, kind of removal of, assum of assumptions and kind of removal of simplifications will be con to consider straight and climbing flight. So if your aircraft is uh, not accelerating, but going through a, um, a steady climb, so it's got a vertical component to its velocity. To do that, you have to pitch the aircraft in a different orientation than straight and level flight. Um, you have to change the forces on the aircraft slightly. And so we have slightly different coordinate systems we have to worry about. So we have to worry about the attitude of the horizon and gravity, which stays in Earth coordinates. Um, but we also have flight path coordinates and we can have our um, thrust offset from the flight path. So an aircraft doesn't fly with its nose perfectly into the wind, depending on the condition the aircraft can be flying on a trajectory that is not the way that the aircraft is pointing. Okay, so if you've got a coordinate system that's anchored to the aircraft, it doesn't necessarily um, line up with the free stream velocity of the air, and it doesn't necessarily line up with the horizon. So we need to be worried about which way, which system all of our forces are actually defined in. So thrust is, is defined in aircraft coordinates because it is anchored to the aircraft. The thrust vector is going to move with however the aircraft moves. Lift and drag are defined in um, free stream uh, air coordinates. So whichever way the air velocity is relative to the aircraft. And weight is defined in gravitational Earth-centered coordinates. Okay, so you've got to worry about if you've got an aircraft that's not in straight level flight, you have to be very careful about the coordinate system that you're using. So this pointing towards the center of the Earth um, doesn't matter so much for um, terrestrial aircraft. There's always kind of a very clear way that down is. When you start worrying about orbits and launch vehicles, then that can be a little bit more of a problem because you are actually moving in a way that your weight vector is changing substantially. Um, but for terrestrial stuff, you just have to remember that weight points to the ground. <clears throat> Now, we use, we analyze aircraft in accelerating um, frames a lot. So aircraft do maneuvers, they do turns, they do um, kind of dive pullouts and different maneuvers that will make the aircraft accelerate in, in our sort of inertial frame. And in the, in the non-inertial frame that it is when it's accelerating, we need to worry about how we do the analysis. And so we use Newton's second law um, and a thing called D'Alembert's principle to take what is F equals MA and we turn the MA part into a force. Okay, So the sum of forces acting on a body is pointing in a particular direction. Now the acceleration as a result of those sum of forces, you've all seen Newton's second law before, you can work out the acceleration by taking the sum of forces and dividing by mass. But in a, uh, an accelerating frame, this actually gives us an opportunity to think about the problem slightly differently. So you've all seen a problem in high school physics where you've got a ball on a string and you're spinning it around in a circle and you're asked what's the tension in the, in the rope as you're spinning that ball around. And it starts all sorts of conversations about centri centripetal acceleration and centrifugal force and is centrifugal force a thing? And, it is. Um, anyone who tells you it's not is wrong. It's never done physics. Um, centrifugal force is a thing um, because we can take all of our centripetal accelerations and turn them into forces using D'Alembert's principle. So we can just flip our accelerations around. We take the MA from one side of the equation, we make it minus MA on the other side of the equation, and we have at least to a first approximation an inertial frame that we can analyze and work out what the forces are. In. Um, and so we can work out the tension in the cable using force equilibrium. We don't have to invoke 
Newton's second law if we're using this thing we call an inertial force, or in this case, it's a centrifugal force. And that's really handy when we're analyzing aircraft that are doing um, all sorts of maneuvers because lots of maneuvers require an acceleration. So the analogy, it's sort of nice visceral one. I think hopefully most people at some point in their life have gone on a roller coaster. Um, you, as you go over a roller coaster, you get um, a different sense of weight. You get a different sense of acceleration. You get all sorts of um, feelings as you go through different parts of the roller coaster, and those can be related to how we kind of think about forces in an airframe. So. Gonna have four cases here where you're right at the top, as you're essentially in free fall, as you're coming through the bottom of a, um, I suppose the equivalent of a dive pull out for an aircraft, but the bottom of a, um, a hill, and then coming over a positive curvature. So in all cases, your weight is exactly the same, um, as far as gravity is concerned. You don't change mass, you don't change G, but you definitely have a different sensation of weight as you go through the roller coaster. Um, and so that's to do with how your acceleration and your weight are related to one another. So when you're at the top and you're moving very slowly, you're essentially quasi static, you're just feeling your full weight, you're just about to roll off. As you accelerate up to essentially um, free fall, your MA, your acceleration is matching your weight. And so you, you sense no weight. As you get to the bottom, you sense a higher weight because your acceleration vector is opposite to your weight vector. And you can actually get the opposite effect. If you go over a hill um, traveling quickly, you get your acceleration in the same direction as your weight and you can actually feel a negative um, weight. So you can feel like you're coming out of your seat. And we can use this D'Alembert's principle to flip the um, acceleration over and make it a force. And then we can really actually get a sense of why we feel heavier or lighter in the different um, cases as a result of that acceleration. And this all ties together with this concept of which we call apparent weight. Um, and you, you'll sense this if, any, if anyone here is an amateur pilot um, flying in small aircraft, they would have had a a visceral sensation of their weight changing as they do certain maneuvers. Um, people riding roller coasters have had the same experience. Even riding in a car that's got a decent acceleration and decent cornering, you'll get a sensation that your weight uh, is changing. So whenever acceleration is involved, um, we can lump all of the, um, in this case, we've got, we're gonna talk about lift specifically, but it can be other forces as well. Um, we take a vector that is opposite to lift and equal in magnitude to lift, and we compare that size of that vector to our weight, and the coefficient we have to put out the front, we call the load factor. And that load factor is essentially the G-force when you say you're doing a 2G turn or you're um, 4G braking that number, that G, is this, it's the load factor. And so if we've got this ball that's accelerating, we can um, turn its acceleration into an inertial force, and we can work out what the apparent weight of that ball is um, using this. Um, it's always a scalar times the weight, and whatever the magnitude of that scalar is. In this case, it looks like it's going to be uh, about 1.4 or 1.5 or something because it's about a 45 degree angle here. But we can just do a vector sum to work out kind of how big that vector is. And we'll use that in, in this class to look at um, maneuvers for an aircraft. So we can apply that to the roller coaster again. And so right at the top, um, your apparent weight is equal to your weight, and so your load factor is one, so it's just sitting there at one G. Um, as you're free falling, your apparent weight 
um, is equal to zero, and so your load factor is zero, so it's zero G, or close enough to it. Um, as you come through the bottom, your load factor is greater than one, so that might be 2G, 3G, depending on how extreme the roller coaster is. And as you come over the hill, if you haven't qu quite lifted out of your seat, if you're still stuck to the ground, but you're lighter than when you started, then your load factor is somewhere between zero and one. So it's this idea that you literally feel that you are actually changing your weight in, in every respect that kind of um, Einstein would tell you that you are actually kind of experiencing a different weight at that moment because you're accelerating. All right, so to turn this into aircraft coordinates and, and worrying about um, the force on the aircraft, we need to have a reference frame for the aircraft that we can talk about. And the standard reference frame for any aircraft is the one I've shown here, where the x-axis, which we call the longitudinal axis, points out through the nose of the aircraft. It's based at the center of gravity for the, for the aircraft. Um, we'll talk about what center of gravity is in a minute. Um, the w y goes out through your right wing, and the z points down. Um, it is a right-handed coordinate system, but it just doesn't have z up, it has z down. Uh, interestingly, there are also names, special names for the rotations about those axes, um, and these are relatively common. A lot of people will have seen these before. If you roll about your longitudinal axis, we call, call it roll. If you rotate about your lateral axis, we call that pitch. It's basically nose up, nose down. Um, or if you uh, rotate around the vertical axis, that's yaw. So the aircraft is um, rotating about its vertical axis. Now, this comes much more into kind of aircraft performance and other parts of, of the degree. We will talk about pitch and yaw and roll a little bit, but um, not an enormous impact on what we're doing with our calculations. Can we also use the x-axis in the other way? Like don't have uh, frame designs and stuff? Mm -hmm. In the opposite direction? Oh, so yeah. So if you are talking about aircraft datums and measuring stations on an aircraft, yes, you start at some datum and you work back the other way. Um, so yeah, if you're talking about structures in a sense where you're not worried about the motion of the airframe, yeah, you're right, they actually do use a <laughs> um, coordinate system that's flipped. But, um, and so yeah, if you've got an aircraft structure that you're talking about kind of a drawing of an aircraft and you wanna know where to position, a, um, uh, like say you're doing weight planning, which we'll talk about at the end of this lecture, and you want to know where to position a, a fuel tank or a piece of baggage, that will actually be measured in a coordinate system that starts at the front and goes backwards, which is odd. But um, generally when we're talking about things in motion like this, and the aircraft is a, is a rigid body that's flying around, this is the coordinate system. When we're worried about how things are placed inside the aircraft, then the coordinate system does flip around. You're right, I hadn't even considered that. It's just, it's so ingrained that, yeah, okay. Um, you'll find throughout this course, there are plenty of cases where people have used some very strange conventions and notations that we just have to live with because they're conventions now. Um, but I would never even considered that that was a strange convention. All right, so let's talk about um, a couple of simple maneuvers or really just one simple maneuver, uh, which is a cool, a turn. Now, as we turn the aircraft, we talk about um, the local radius, or so the instantaneous radius of um, turning or radius of curvature of our maneuver. And if we're doing that carefully and we're keeping the nose pointed in the direction, in the um, tangent to our radius of or the circumference of our turn, we call that a coordinated turn. Um, if the nose is pointing outwards, it's called a slipping turn. If the nose is pointing inwards, it's a skidding turn. Um, and you can kind of imagine a, a car doing that maneuver. We would think, yeah, yeah, you can like oversteer, understeer sort of. Um, but the one that we care about, pilots are very good at doing coordinated turns. And so 
we mostly analyze coordinated turns. Um, and then the others are just sort of a slight additional complexity, but not too, too hard. Now, when you do a coordinated turn, um, hang on, oh, yeah, you can't just um, uh, have the aircraft just turn a corner. It needs to have some kind of force that's accelerating it towards the center of the turn. Um, and so if you've got an aircraft that is flying along straight and level, the, if we think about the forces that we've got, lift, drag, weight, and thrust, so far none of them are pointing in a direction that's going to create any kind of lateral force to accelerate the aircraft. Um, and so we need a force, this mv squared on r, or we need acceleration v squared on r towards the center to make the aircraft actually go around the corner. And so to do that, we have to bank the aircraft, we have to roll it, um, and that which we, we call bank angle, the other one of my other diagrams has an angle in here. This bank angle gives us a component of lift that's pointing towards the middle of the turn that allows us to do the turn in a coordinated way. And we can think about this in terms of centripetal acceleration, or we can think about it in terms of centrifugal force, both are equally valid. Um, I find it easier to do, use forces because we can just use an equilibrium expression and not have to worry about um, second law problems. Um, and we can also, in this case, think about our apparent weight as well. So in this case, the apparent weight, equal and opposite to lift, and it's some um, constant multiple of our weight vector. And the bank angle here, which is normally written as phi, or the roll angle, for some reason it's called bank angle when you're in a turn rather than roll angle, but um, <clears throat> the, that is related to the apparent weight in a way that we'll see in a minute. So, uh, if we look at this problem here, it's a pretty easy thing to work out what's happening with um, the, the relationship between our bank angle and our uh, and our weight here, or our or our load uh, load factor. So what we want is we want load factor as a function of this um, phi. because then we can use that to work out what the forces are on the airframe. Because the load factor, as we'll see um, in a little bit, is kind of like one of the, one of the basic um, terms in all of our um, design and stress calculations for the aircraft. Because if the aircraft is doing a 2G maneuver or a load factor 2 maneuver, all of the forces are bigger by two. So the lift's bigger by two, all the weights are bigger by two, all the stresses are bigger by two. So kind of everything scales linearly with this load factor. So it's important to get a handle on, on how it relates to the condition of the aircraft. So we can say in this case that um, N is, well, we, let's, let's define some coordinates first. In this case, we're going to have ground-centered coordinates, X and Y, and very simply, sum of forces y equals zero, uh, lift cos phi minus weight equals zero. We can um, rearrange this and say that um, lift equals n weight, so we can have n w cos phi minus w equals zero, or we could equally say that um, n equals lift over w, but we can we can do that another way. And then if we rearrange this, um, I'm not gonna do the rearrangement step by step. We just get that um, n equals one over cos phi. So the, as you bank the aircraft, 
the load factor increases. Um, obviously, you can't do a coordinated turn with a bank angle of 90 degrees because then there's nothing, no component of lift fighting against your weight and you're sinking. Um, so there's some angle between um, zero bank angle and, and 90 at which everything's going to be balanced for a particular radius of turn. And we can think just as a couple of benchmark points here for a 2G manoeuvre where if you were sitting in the aircraft you would feel twice as heavy, that um, corresponds to a bank angle of 60 degrees. Okay. So when you see um, the Red Bull pilots doing really extreme high G manoeuvres, they're pulling, if they're doing it in a, in a um, level coordinated way, which they're often not because they're accelerating all over the place, but um, even just to get 2G, they're banking the aircraft to, to 60 degrees. And there's a whole lot of derivations that really aren't important to this course, but you can just use them as, um, as derivations where you can relate the thrust required, the velocity in the turn, the turn rate, the radius of the turn, back to um, either the velocity before the turn, which is V naught, or the thrust before the turn, T naught, or the velocity in the turn, uh, or the thrust in the turn. So you can kind of, lots of different derivations there that you can use at your leisure um, for a coordinated turn. We, we basically can derive everything about the turn just knowing the load factor because that sort of describes the motion. Um, so your thrust goes up linearly with the load factor. Your um, velocity, the local velocity, the instantaneous velocity of the aircraft um, goes up with the square root of load factor. Um, and there's the radius of the turn you can calculate as well from a few different things. Now, some of these symbols may not mean much to you today, like CL coefficient of lift um, and some of these other symbols. Trust me, within the next few weeks, they will. <laughs> they're, thin, they're things that if you haven't come across these things before, they will become familiar to you in other courses pretty quickly. OK, so we're tracking all right for time. Um, <coughs> I want to talk about the flight envelope, which is um, a way that we can start to think about how you design an airframe because an aircraft experiences so many different conditions when it's flying. Um, the loads vary depending on airspeed, acceleration. So um, you haven't seen the lift equation formally in a class yet. Um, Okay, so the lift that the aircraft generates is proportional to the air density, the velocity squared, the planform area, which is the wing area, and this thing called coefficient of lift, which is not my job to teach you about. But as the condition of the aircraft changes, the lift is changing, um, and so you're constantly balancing these things. Um, when you're doing maneuvers, when you def deflect your control surfaces to make the aircraft do maneuvers, um, so we need a sensible way to say, okay, this is an envelope around all the different load cases that an aircraft could experience um, and design to that condition rather than trying to kind of itemize every single case that an aircraft could see in its lifetime. Um, and we do, we, this allows us to identify critical load cases. So what we mean by critical load case, so those ones that define cases where it's a unique set of forces on the aircraft that could break things in a particular way, and we use that as a point that says, okay, well, this is one critical load case. There are lots of load cases that don't stress the airframe as much as that, um, and but we can identify a handful of those critical load cases. And when I say handful, um, modern airframes are probably designed to 5,000 or so critical load cases. Um, they, older airframes would have been probably only 15 or 20. Um, but the 
we use those critical load cases to then kind of put a box around um, an envelope around the kind of condition that the aircraft could experience. And all of this is defined for, um, for civilian aircraft in the FAR regulations, which um, we just use pretty much wholesale. Um, so these are from the Federal Aviation Authority in the States, um, which promulgate federal air regulations. Um, and we have the same. We have this CASA and CASR, um, which are the which is the body and the regulations respectively. Um, but we use all the same numbering and everything. So FAR 23 is aircraft that are um, civilian small aircraft, generally general aviation, not like not commercial aircraft under 12 and a half thousand pounds. Um, so most light aircraft fall in that category. And for anything that's 12 passengers or 12 and a half thousand pounds or more falls into um, FAR 25. Um, FAR 23 is kind of the easier one to understand because it's designed to be a bit simpler because the aircraft are, are smaller and a bit more, um, intended to be a bit more flexible. And in fact, in the last few years, it's actually become very flexible. The regulations themselves actually don't specify much at all. They just say you have to meet, uh, you have to demonstrate that you meet these standards. But all of the calculations that used to be in the regs are now in these um, ASTM standards. So if you want to know how to calculate the forces on an aircraft, then going to something like ASTM um, 53116 is a good starting point for all of the loads um, on an aircraft. Now, this is not going to be a very easy document to manage today, but over the course of these 10 weeks and working on the major project, I'm expecting that a fair bit of this regulation will start sneaking into your major project as you start analysing your airframe. But the key cornerstone of what's in those regulations to do with um, airframe loads is this thing called a flight envelope, uh, sometimes called a VN diagram, where we put um, equivalent airspeed on one axis, and this is VE, I should be more precise about that, um, equivalent airspeed versus the load factor, and we draw this interestingly shaped box, and there are some tweaks, like the details down here change a bit depending on the type of aircraft, and some of the details may change a little bit, but more or less, this is the standard shape for um, for a normal flight condition. There's another thing that you can overlay if you're considering gusts, but for a normal flight condition, um, this is what we see. And it basically says that every aircraft needs to be able to survive entirely within this um, envelope. And so if we think about a normal flight condition, which is at V cruise, which is VC here, um, and, a, and a straight and level flight, that's at N equals one. So an aircraft will spend a lot of its life just sitting here at straight and level flight, N equals one, cruise velocity, just boringly flying along. Um, and we, it's good that this point is a long way from the boundaries because the boundaries are when things go bad. Okay? <laughs> so we don't want to take the aircraft outside of this envelope because it's not designed to do that. So um, just defining what some of the, the boundaries are, what the boundaries mean. So if we go to um, the, the fast end, this is what we call the design dive speed. Um, somewhere in here, there's another thing that's called, um, oh, I'm going to have to bring my pen back. What's happened to my pen? Nope. All right. Let me just wake it up again. There we go. Um, design dive speed. So that's where if you get an aircraft, and for whatever reason, the pilot decides to 
just drop the nose at the ground and fly as fast as I can at the ground. At some point, the speed of the aircraft is going to create a phenomenon called divergence or flutter, and the wings will twist off the aircraft and you'll have no longer uh, an aircraft in one piece. Where does the never exceed sit? Yeah, yeah. so the never exceeds is a speed that sits in here. It, it, defined in the regulations, it's something like 90% of the um, design dive speed. Um, depends on, again, the type of aircraft, whether it's a light sports aircraft or a GA, but there's some percentage of the design dive speed is the velocity never exceed. Um, so this little corner bit doesn't mean much. We won't worry too much about that. Um, but all of these straight lines um, are when pilots are going to break the aircraft. These curvy lines are when physics breaks the aircraft. Um, so the, at the top, we've got the um, maximum positive load factor. So if you did a real extreme maneuver, aircraft are designed to withstand a particular load factor. So for lo a lot of um, general aviation aircraft, that's somewhere in the order of three, like two and a half to three and a half, something like that. Um, depends on the weight of the airframe and a few other conditions. But this is somewhere on the order of three. So that's the load factor in which if it's exceeded, the airframe is no longer airworthy. Yeah, so you will, we'll talk about what it means and whether it actually breaks or not in just a moment. But this is, the, this is where you'll start to break the aircraft. Things will, um, an aircraft should never see a load higher than that in its lifetime. It won't necessarily fall apart if it goes higher than that because there's another factor added on top. But um, an aircraft should spend its life entirely inside that bubble. Um, yeah, so it's th there's a phenomena that we'll talk about right at the end of term um, called uh, divergence, and another one that's related to silitary one called flutter, which is where the airflow and the um, structural resonance couple together, and you'll eventually just through s something similar to resonance snap bits of the aircraft off, um, and it's very very sensitive to the speed of the airframe. So. Um, and it is related to, to dynamic pressure, but it's 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 actually a more complicated phenomenon than that. So you you, you start um, you start coupling in um, aerodynamics into the structural resonance, and things go badly very quickly. Um, <clears throat> same at the bottom. This is negative maneuvers. So negative G maneuvers are like pushovers, where your weight goes in the opposite direction, um, and so aircraft aren't designed to generally to have as high a magnitude of pushover maneuver as they are, say, a dive pullout. So the aircraft can accelerate um, towards the, the sort of in a negative Z direction much more easily than it can in the positive Z direction. Um, so if you're in a normal aircraft, head up, wings level, and you go into a dive and pull out of that dive, you're accelerating upwards. And that aircraft is designed to um, survive quite a high load factor in that case. If you're flying along and you push the aircraft over really quickly and accelerate downwards, it's not designed to survive as much. But in saying that, the aircraft starts its, its time here. So there is actually quite a bit of tolerance between there. Um, so the aircraft lives at n equals 1 most of the time. So there's, there's more leeway there than it looks like. So you've actually got to overcome gravity first to get back to zero, and then you've got to go even harder than that to, to get into negative G. Um, down this end is the stall speed. So if you're flying at straight and level, the stall speed is defined by basically the speed that you can't fly slower than, and it relates to that half row V squared SCL calculation that the, the um, the lifting devices on the aircraft, the wings and the flaps and other things have a maximum coefficient of lift that they can generate. And if you um, fly slower than a certain speed, the airflow stops providing lift and you fall like a very expensive stone. Um, and so we don't go slower than that. 
And so when you take off, you're already taking off in a regime where your speed is higher than the stall speed. So you're never off the ground in a condition where you're below the stall speed. Um, and then these curves, these are parabolas that are actually defined by that half row V squared SCL max. Okay, so if you try and do a maneuver where you're at fairly low speed and you try and accelerate upwards really quickly, you're actually asking for more force than the aerodynamics can provide. So this is, this is your aircraft, if you're flying fast enough, you're, you can break the aircraft with the airflow. If you're flying slow, the airflow just, there's just not enough energy in it for the physics to allow it to break the airframe. So you will stall out the wings before you will break the aircraft. If you try and start here and, and pull a high G maneuver, the aircraft will stall out. And so there's, so this is physics getting in the way, but most of the cases are when pilots break out uh, lovely aircraft on us. So you've got to make sure that the, your, they stay as close to the middle as they, uh, as they can. But when we design, the critical cases for us in this course, well, actually the, the majority of the critical cases we worry about is this line here, because the aircraft um, stresses are highest there, and the, more or less a lot of the mechanics of the aircraft work, whether you're in positive um, uh, G or negative G, positive or negative. So this one generally ends up being the worst because it's the highest magnitude. Um, and so the condition that we design a lot to is this maximum or N1, N max. And it doesn't really matter the speed. In a lot of our calculations, the speed isn't that important because it's this, this line actually defines the force that's on the airframe. So it doesn't really matter how fast you're going if you know the force um, that your airframe is experiencing. Um, but as, as I said before, if you cross this line, it doesn't necessarily mean your aircraft's going to break. Um, there's two different load maximum loads that are defined for airframes. One is the limit load, which is the maximum possible load that your aircraft should ever see in its lifetime. So assuming it's not being flown in a way that is intentionally mal malicious by a pilot, um, is designed within its, within its gust envelope and everything is um, fine. Going back one here, there's a little complication here. Gusts can change the shape of this a little bit, but we won't worry about that right now. Um, but assuming you're in, within your gust envelope and your flight envelope, um, then the aircraft is not allowed to have any change of state. So you can't have any material yielding. You can't. Basically, you're within the elastic range of all of your materials. So if you go up to limit and you come back down to the ground, the aircraft should be essentially identical to what it was um, before it did that maneuver. Um, there's another higher load level we define called ultimate load level, which is one and a half times limit. So if your N1 was three, your um, N for ultimate load will be four and a half. So it's a higher load again. And that is basically defined as the ultimate strength of the airframe when it comes off the production line. You need to design your aircraft to be stronger than ultimate. And if you look at a wing ultimate load test, you can, you can Google this, just look up, I think 787 has got some interesting pictures out there. 787 wing ultimate load test and the wings are nearly touching each other. <laughs> they're, like, they've basically put big jacks on the aircraft and reef the wings to try and pull them off the airframe. Um, and it needs to be able to survive that for three seconds um, and land safely, but it's allowed to be very damaged in the process. So things can be deformed and changed and broken to a point um, as long as it's within safety margins. Um, what about instantaneous forces like severe turbulence? Is that yeah. Like so se severe turbulence, if it's you're designed to a particular turbulence uh, envelope, and that's what I was talking about gusts here. You actually, there's an overlay you can put over the top of this that accounts for 
different speeds of gusts and flight conditions and it depends on this thing called your um what is that WRS I've forgotten the name for it wing loading that's right it depends on your wing loading um sometimes gusts are not a problem for planes at all if they're high wing loading aircraft gusts kind of don't matter if they're low wing loading aircraft then you, you end up with this big spike in the middle here where you actually have to design to a much higher um, load factor but assuming you've designed within that envelope normal turbulence conditions should still have you within limit but you might have a case where there's just something super extreme you, you hadn't predicted um, and that would be enough to you still should be within ultimate to allow for um, the aircraft to safely land all right so if we just i mean you can draw that on on the diagram as well um, you still will have this portion of the gust curve but it allows you to have a higher um, load before the aircraft will actually snap into so far all we've worried about is we've kind of treated the aircraft like a point like a rigid body all the forces have been acting on the aircraft and we haven't had to worry about what's happening kind of inside the aircraft um, and so resolving all of the lift as one vector was fine um, for some calculations but we don't generate lift as like one force there's not one sort of cable grabbing on the aircraft and pulling all in one spot we're generating lift all over the place um, and we're generating weight all over the place so we we have to know kind of what's happening inside the aircraft and to do that we need to know how those lifts are distributed across the um, airframe so the span wise distribution i'm going to talk about span and cord when we talk about a wing span is kind of like your arm span um, and the cord is the distance front to back along the wing um, in the direction of flight so the span wise distribution of the lift um, tends to drop off as you go to the wing tips uh, depending on the shape of the wing and taper and other things it, it drops off more so um, there's a whole lot of aerodynamics involved in that that is above my pay grade um, but basically most of the lift is generated sort of at the inboard parts of the wing little bits over the fuselage because the fuselage itself does sort of catch airflow depending on the angle of attack of the fuselage it also generates a lot of drag um, but it's not a uniform distributed load um, and there's up there's ways of approximating that distribution one kind of ancient one that's still kind of relevant is strengths distribution but there are better um, algorithms as well um, now in terms of cord wise distribution now we've taken a slice through the wing and we're looking kind of as if we've got a 2d airfoil here um, the way that we generate lift is through pressure distribution um, there's there's a lot of complexity in how lift is described but in, if, um, for our purposes we think about it as pressure on on the structure because that's what we're designing um, how that pressure is generated and all the momentum transfer that's involved in that um, that's for your aerodynamics course not for this one um, but when you resolve all of the um, forces you end up with some kind of pressure distribution on the wing so you got whatever your um, your reference pressure is you could say you've got a upwards pressure acting on the bottom and a upwards pressure acting on the top um, which is kind of pulling the the wing up and if you do the integral the, the vector sum of all of that you can resolve all of those forces as a single vector so it's a kind of 2d integral and that acts at a point we call a center of pressure and so that hasn't been resolved into lift or drag or any of those things yet that's just all of the aerodynamic forces acting on that 2d airfoil are pointing in that direction if we resolve that in free stream coordinates we can resolve that as a lift and a drag so there is a drag component 
that's not skin friction or anything like that. It's literally a generating lift creates drag um, and those pressure distributions um, will have a drag component. Now, one of the problems with this is that as your angle of attack changes, um, and I was just having a sort of in-depth conversation about angle of attack a minute ago, as the airflow, as the airfoil changes its angle relative to the airflow, that's what we call angle of attack, this pressure distribution changes. You generate more lift as you increase the angle and generate less lift or even negative lift as you decrease the angle. Um, and this center of pressure moves around because the, the shape of this distribution changes, the magnitudes of the lift and drag change, um, and the kind of location moves. Now, we have this other thing, which we can define called the aerodynamic center, which is like you would do a change of um, coordinates in first year mechanics. You can just move this force system from here to here, but in the process, you've got to add a moment in to keep everything balanced. Um, and the benefit of this aerodynamic center is there exists a point at which even though the lift and drag are changing, the moment is constant and that point doesn't move. So as your angle of attack changes, this point stays in the same spot. The, ma the lift magnitude will change and the drag magnitude will change, but the moment won't and this point won't move. So it's really helpful for calculations. Um, and for a lot of aircraft, this is pretty close to what we call the quarter cord. So if you go from the nose to the tail of the cord and you go 25% of the way along, the aerodynamic center is basically at the quarter cord location. Give or take, depending on the um, airfoil description. So when we come to doing 3D calculations of uh, forces on our wings, knowing kind of where the lift is distributed um, along the core direction matters because that will actually change the amount of torque that the wing is under. So if you imagine you're generating lift forward on the wing or back on the wing, that's creating a, a different torque contribution on the wing. And so knowing that's important. Now we're going to do a bit on uh, weights and balances. Um, this is new stuff. So this is another little bit of new stuff. I taught a first year aviation class last year um, that had a bunch about weights and balances. And I realized that our aero students didn't actually get any kind of standard treatment of how um, weights work in an aircraft. So some of this may seem a little bit basic, but it's kind of important to go back to the start, I think. Um, so aircraft don't have um, any reaction forces. So they need to be balanced about their CG um, by the, like the airflow needs to be balanced about their center of gravity. So all of the weight and all of the lift needs to be acting through the same point. Otherwise the aircraft won't be stable. And that's a surprisingly hard thing to do with this complicated 3D thing that's flying through the air at um, hundreds of kilometers an hour. And so there's a point about this center of gravity where we have to balance our moments in, in 3D, get everything so there's no roll moment, no yaw moment, and no pitch moment. And also the forces need to balance out. So I mean, that's not hard conceptually to understand that. Um, let me just pretty good reference for all of these calculations uh, is the weight and balance handbook put out by the FAA. Uh, it's just a really good, very, very easy to read and understand guide for how to do um, weights and balances. It's designed for non-engineers. Um, and so lots of pilots, people doing kind of flight operations don't have engineering training and so need to know how to do moments and balances and stuff. So it's designed to be very, very easy to read. Um, and it's a really good reference to get started for all this stuff. So when we worry about um, 
balancing this out, we need to think about all the different components that we've got to worry about. So lift, how it's distributed. So we talked about um, how the lift is distributed on the wing, but there's also a minor contribution from the tail. Okay, And we actually will see when we start doing this calculation that the reason that the tail plane is there is to provide a, a lift component that helps balance out a particular pitching moment of the aircraft. Um, and so if that wasn't there, we would have an unstable airframe. Um, now there's control forces. So when we talk about control forces, uh, forces from our um, control surfaces that we'll cover in more detail next week, but your rudders and your elevators and your ailerons that are giving you all of your control of the aircraft and they're generating forces. Um, drag, drag is distributed. So the bulk of the drag is obviously coming from the fuselage and all the bits that are, that are not providing lift, but also the wings are draggy, the engines are draggy, um, and knowing how that's all distributed affects the balance of the aircraft. Weight is probably the biggest thing that affects the balance of the aircraft. So where all the weight is, where your fuel weight is, where your passenger weight is, where your um, baggage and, and whatever payload you've got on the aircraft. Moving weight around in the aircraft is, is um, especially in small aircraft, moving weight around is one of the ways that um, uh, aircraft become unstable very, very quickly. Um, and there's been plenty of, plenty of aircraft that have gone down because part of their cargo has shifted and it's moved the CG out of the stable location and the aircraft is not even controllable. So even if the pilot puts in maximum control authority, the, there's just no way that the aircraft can be controllable with the, with the weight that's moved around. Um, and thrust. So your engines aren't always lined up with your CG. So when you're generating thrust, that's creating a moment that's pitching your nose up or pitching your nose down, depending on where the thrust is relative to the, to the CG. So all these things need to be taken into consideration because we're worried about all of the moments in the different directions. Now, when we're actually trying to balance that out, so there's, we need to worry about um, what we're doing pre-flight, what we're doing during the flight, and the ways that we're actually controlling things. So the two primary ways we have of controlling things are controlling where the weight is and controlling where the lift is. Controlling where the lift is is primarily done by the aircraft designer before it's um, before the aircraft starts flying. But during the flight, we have one major control, uh, which is trim and, and our kind of control scheme. Weight, we have a bit more control over. So we can move fuel, we can move passengers, we can move cargo. Passengers and cargo, we can't generally move during the flight, but fuel, we can. We can move fuel around to keep the aircraft trimmed out. Um, and so there's a, there's a two-step process here. One is getting the balance right before. So if you, especially if you fly light aircraft, you'll have to do a, a weights and balance check before you get in the aircraft. Um, if you're going flying at Bankstown in week six, um, then you have to get on the scale, weigh yourself, and that goes into the weight and balance calculation. So you can't you can't cheat and say, well, actually no. So I, like, if you've had a couple of burgers the day before, you, you it comes out on the scale, and you have to be has to go into the calculation, um, because if you get that wrong, you can make the aircraft unstable. Um, and and so they need to know who's sitting in what seat and all that sort of stuff. What um, you sort of uh, blended wing like passenger aircraft concepts like the just single like delta yeah. where they want to see passengers in the like yeah. the core of the wing. Would that mean weight and balances with passengers then becomes far more important because the moment Yeah, the end, yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. So the the balance with passengers does become important even with traditional airframe uh, configurations, but the difference with um longitudinal balance is that um, if, you, if you've got a full aircraft where you've got a, your, the aircraft is at its limits in terms of its lift generation, its control authority and everything, then by default, 
the lift is also relatively well distributed because the passengers sort of fill up all the seats. Um, it's when you've got kind of a half full aircraft that things become a problem and they will actually, um, airlines will have systems that automatically space the passengers out so they're not all clumped at the back or clumped at the front. Um, and yeah, you've just got another dimension to worry about if your passengers are out. Um, lateral balance, you need to worry about that as well. Um, <clears throat> Now, we're going to do a really simple CG calculation um, just so that everyone uh, knows how to do moment balance and, and CG calculations. So we know, I mean, this, this is not new information, hopefully, otherwise you, I don't know how you got to third year mechanical engineering, but you can balance <laughs> moments about a point. Um, and you can see this is first year aviation student slides, but we'll get, we'll get there, we'll get to harder stuff. Um, but we're going to do an example where um, we can define, we can redefine any distribution of masses as a single mass at a new point called the center of gravity. So we can take a whole bunch of masses and we can put them at one, we can sum up the masses and we can work out where that location is. So let's go ahead and do one of those calculations. All right. So our equation here. We're do, going to do the sum of the mass times its distance over the sum of the masses. Now, I'm not going to worry about subscripts, um, but we're worried about if we've got, a, in this case, three different masses, we've got three different distances, and we want to work out where the CG is going to be. And you can extend this into 3D in exactly the same way. You just pick the different directions and it, it's all fine. Um, so let's do our sum of masses. And I can do that without a calculator. We're going to have 18 kilograms. Okay. Now let's do sum of masses times distances. Now, whenever we're doing this, it's sort of implied, but it's worth stating directly, you need a datum. CG doesn't mean anything unless it's relative to something. Like we don't know where the CG is unless we're measuring relative to something. So every aircraft will have a datum defined that it's measured relative to. Um, or if we've got our own coordinate system, we can say, okay, give me the CG in, in this particular coordinate system. So without this datum, um, this calculation doesn't mean anything. And so let's uh, do that calc then. So we're going to have 10 times one plus two times two plus six times three equals. Now, another thing about this class that I haven't mentioned yet is that uh, in the lectures, I don't use any calculating devices. In the workshops, I'll have MATLAB and stuff open, but in the lectures, it's calculation via democracy. So if, <laughs> <laughs> if you all get it wrong, we're all gonna crash and burn in our aircraft in future, but hopefully, by democracy, we will get to the right answer. Okay, so everyone can can bring your calculators and crack into some of the calculations. Um, get get yourself in the habit of of doing the calcs on the fly. So I'm hoping everyone can do this calculation. Thirty-two kilogram meters. I'm going to put dimensions on that because it um, it's just it it gets important because most of the calculations we're going to do during this uh, term are going to be in newtons and millimeters and things, and we need to be very very careful about describing what units we're using because um, we will also use some um, imperial units um, because half the world's aircraft ish are still designed using imperial units, so. Um, <laughs> we, we can't ignore them. And if you want to work in that part of the world, um, as an aerospace engineer, you need to know how imperial units work. Um, and they're really not that hard once you've used them a couple of times. They're actually, there's some parts of imperial units that are better than SI. Um, don't let anyone hit me say that. But um, <laughs> So, um, what's our CG location? 
Four point. Let's just do three significant figures here. We don't need any more than that. Four point seven eight. Oh, one point seven eight. Sorry, one point seven eight. One point seven eight meters. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Yeah. So we're in here. Okay. So that's not a hard calculation. So, um, but it, obviously, if you're doing this over an entire aircraft, um, you're not going to be tracking the weight of every bolt and every nut and screw and thing that's in the aircraft. So there's a defined way of working out where the CG of the empty airframe is. And then when you add stuff to it, like fuel and passengers, then you can do the calculation with them. But the aircraft CG is just one mass and one location to worry about. And it specifies like how many manuals are on board and all that sort of stuff. So the aircraft is defined in a particular state and you're weighed in that state. Um, and if and then everything else you add is extra on top of that. The dry weight is so precisely defined. Why are passengers not really weighed that much? Like, you know, you know, they don't on big aircraft, it doesn't matter so much because it's more like there's a much wider range of CG that the aircraft is controllable in. And especially with swept wing aircraft, there's a bigger range again because your fuel, you can use your fuel to trim out the aircraft. Um, but it becomes much more important for straight wing, small general aviation aircraft, where if you take 100 kilos from here to there, it does make a big difference. Whereas um, with, a, with a big aircraft, it's just, it all comes out in the wash. Like they will still do automated ticketing, so like seat allocations so that you're roughly distributed. And when they're putting the baggage in, all the baggage is weighed. And so they know what order to put the bag bags in. So um, they don't just stick all the heavy bags down the back and the light bags in the front. <clears throat> so a bunch of that happens sort of behind the scenes that you don't know about, but they don't make passengers walk over the scales. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Hold on to that thought. It's a good thought. Um, <clears throat> we'll get to that before the end of the class. Um, now we're going to do another calculation, which is similar, but uh, slightly different. So we're going to think about now if we do a free body diagram for part of the aircraft, how would we do a moment balance on, on something like this? So we're going to take a wing. We've got the engine locations and the masses of the engines. We've got the wing uh, weight and its CG location, assuming it's in a given state with all its fuel and whatever we, we want in it. What is the uh, bending moment at the wing root? So we caught this, the root, like the inner part of the wing as it attaches to the fuselage. Um, so the wing root, like my shoulder and the wing tip is out where my fingers are. Um, so what's the bending moment going to be there? And this is a slightly more complicated calculation, but still should be pretty straightforward. So one thing that um, we have to be careful of is conventions. Um, I'm not too fussy about what convention you use for shear forces and bending moments and all that sort of stuff, as long as it's consistent. That's the critical thing, is whatever your convention is has to stay exactly the same through your calculations, otherwise things break down. So in this case, we're, we can say sum of moments, um, and we're going to take it about, we're going to just call this point A. Sum of moments about A, anti-clockwise positive equals zero. And it's helpful to define what calculation you're doing. And so the let's go ahead and do this calculation. There's one trick here, which is we, you've been given masses, but you'll need weights. So we need to remember to include G um, in our calculations. And that's one good thing about uh, imperial calculations. Most of the time, you don't need to worry about G. If something's 10 pounds, it's 10 pounds. It's 10 pounds. You never have to worry about putting G in the calcs, which is very handy sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so we will do our, um, we'll do this expression. Okay, so the unknown moment is positive. It's anti-clockwise. And then we're going to have the first engine minus its moment arm times its mass. I'm going to do this all in SI um, times G, and G is 10. 
Um, <laughs> it's near enough. <laughs> well within the margin of error of the calculations we do in this course, so don't. Um, you'll never get marked out in this course for saying G's 10. Um, <clears throat> no, actually, I no, you're right. That, that all of my calculations in anything that's auto marked are bigger tolerance than that. That's like 2% error. It's like everything's got a bigger tolerance than that. So <laughs> even if you use it in calculations, you'll never get it wrong. I think formally all the calculations are done with 9.8, but it's it's... It's within within margin. Minus 20, uh, I'm going to put, be consistent here, 10 times 20,000 times 10. And last one, minus uh, 18 times 6250 times 10 equals zero. So M equals... And what units are we going to get out? Newton meters. Yeah. Units are something I'm particularly picky about because it is really important to get units right in engineering. It's like the source of so, so, so many problems, people getting their units wrong, including smashed, uh, smashed up um, space probes on the surface of Mars. Um, <laughs> That's a story for later, but there are there are lots and lots of disasters that have happened in aerospace because of people getting units wrong. Um, so I'm particularly fussy about units. G being 10, that's within the margin of any calculation. Yep. Getting your units wrong and being out by a factor of a thousand, not within margins of with it, margin of error. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it happens. So being out by 2%, not really a problem in most engineering. Being out by a factor of 1,000, definitely a problem. Um, all right, so what's our moment here? Sorry, 3,000. I'm, I'm just going to stick with three significant figures here, kilonewton meters. Okay, this is another thing about engineering is knowing, like I will generally round things to three significant figures, uh, knowing when uh, numerical precision is required and when it's not is another thing that I hope you glean from some of the examples in this course. Um, precision is really really important in when you're taking differences of things when you have one thing subtracting something else knowing like all of the number is important because what's the remainder when you subtract things can be really important but for most calculations three significant figures is way more than what any sort of it, it more than covers the uncertainty in the inputs like i've given an input to three significant figures um, I've given these inputs to two significant figures. Like if that was 7.1 metres and not seven, you've kind of swamped any need to go more than three significant figures here. So you can only specify your answer as well as you specify your input. So if you're given low precision inputs, you don't need a high precision output. Um, so yeah, no, knowing numerical precision and when it's good and when it's not required um, is something that's good practice to not just write out big long strings of numbers. Um, ex when people do calculations in Excel and MATLAB, I'm so often getting it like, oh, what's the, the distance here? And it'll be like 2.3467897412 metres. And you're like, well, that's like the distance, the radius of a hydrogen atom, that last significant figure. Like you just, you, you can't, it's not, doing that copy and paste is not using the brain to put the answer on the page. All right, so um, let's, Go on to the next bit, um, which is, I already mentioned this, weighing the aircraft. Okay, so this is something that um, you may actually get some introduction to at Bankstown, maybe not, but um, this is the kind of size of aircraft that they fly out at Bankstown. Um, and weighing these aircraft happens in a very particular way. So, in the manual for the aircraft, it'll say 
put all this standard equipment in the aircraft, and that includes things like what documents are in there, um, what instruments, um, there'll be a standard residual fuel generally. So like the fuel will be at some kind of residual minimum. Um, put all this on the aircraft and that's your defined um, dry aircraft weight. Um, and they'll give you a datum. So it's sometimes the nose, sometimes it's, um, it's very often the engine firewall, it's sometimes the leading edge of the wing, but there's some defined place to start your measurement from. That's easy to find. Um, and then you go ahead and try and calculate or measure the CG relative to that to that datum. And so roll the aircraft onto um, load transducers, essentially big scales, um, measure the reaction force at all of the wheels, and then you can work out the CG of the aircraft. All right, so this is an example, and we're going to dive into Imperial units now. Um, <clears throat> pounds and inches. And this is where Imperial units actually are really useful. As I mentioned before, not having to worry about gravity in your calculations is actually a really useful thing. When you're talking about weights, for like pounds mass and pounds force, it's useful to specify, but in most calculations, it actually doesn't matter whether you use pounds mass or pounds force, you'll get the same answer. Um, there's a few cases where you need to take G out of calculations when you need a mass. Um, so for densities and things, you'll often have densities specified in strange units like slugs. Um, but for most, of the, for most structures calculations, imperial units are actually really, really um, helpful. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to work out the moment of um, the reaction forces, and then we can work out kind of what our CG location is. Okay, so we, we need the total, of the sum of the weights and the sum of the moments, and then we can work out the CG by taking the sum of the moments and dividing by the, by the weights. So we need a sum down here, and we need a sum down here, and then you can take the ratio of those to get your um, CG location. And then to get the moment, you're doing a multiplication here. <clears throat> and the moment arm is defined as negative if it's um, to the, in the nose direction. So this is where this kind of C, the coordinate system shifts. When you're doing structures calculations on the airframe itself, you're normally having a coordinate that runs from nose to tail. So you can see here, although I didn't show it in the diagram, um, hopefully you've all worked out that the this is a tricycle gear. Um, there's one nose wheel and two main wheels. And so there's the left and the right, which is obviously not shown in this 2D diagram. Um, so you, you would have three scales under the, under the aircraft. Tricycle gear are much, much more stable to um, take off and land than tail draggers. Um, uh, but tail draggers have some advantages, especially on really, really rough landing strips. And so a lot of agricultural planes and things will be tail draggers. But um, the vast majority of aircraft you'll see out there of all scales will be, will be tricycle gear set up like this.
So, um, sum of all the weights. Has anyone got that number? 2006. And this will be a negative number in here. Okay, so you need to keep your negatives and your positives. What that's saying is that the reaction force here is clockwise about our datum and the reaction force here is anti-clockwise about our datum, so their moments are opposite. Someone got a sum down here? 66,032. The rest of the room agree? No? Different number? 65756. Okay, democracy, this is we're seeing it in action here. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're right, just means you're popular. Um, <laughs> so now we are going to take the ratio of these. So if you take the, the um, moment divided by the weight, that gives you your um, CG location. Thirty two inches. Thirty two and a bit inches. Point eight. Yeah, see that's where three significant figures is even though we're talking about sub inch here, you'll see in a minute with the graphs that like the CG range that's stable on this aircraft is about six or seven inches. So you don't you want to know that to a relatively high precision. Um, Probably not much more than that, like hundredths of an inch is not going to matter, but one, like a, a tenth of an inch probably matters, or eight tenths of an inch. <clears throat> and, okay, so, yeah, the, the stability range of these is, um, is pretty narrow. So we'll talk about why and how we come to that stability range. So when we balance the aircraft out, generally lateral balance is pretty easy. Aircraft just mostly symmetric about their center line um, and fuel tanks are symmetrically distributed passengers if they're not symmetrically distributed are so close to the axis to the cg that it doesn't matter so much so all the bits that matter all the lifts and everything that are uh, symmetrically distributed <coughs> so so lateral balance is actually generally pretty easy if you do get a situation where say a fuel tank has a leak and you need to isolate that fuel tank, um, which does happen, then you'll put all of the fuel onto the side that's safe because um, almost all aircraft have some kind of cross-feed pump or something that will allow them to, to isolate fuel tanks. Um, and then that will cause a lateral imbalance and you will balance that with ailerons so your control surfaces will deflect. Um, that will generate additional drag, and then you would you, that drag will be asymmetric, and you'll balance that out with your tail. And so there's a bit of a kind of dance that happens with your control surfaces to get it to balance out. But it's something that's because there's so much control authority in the ailerons, little bit of imbalance in the fuel is not at all putting the aircraft into an unsafe situation. Longitudinal balance is the one where aircraft get unsafe very, very quickly because if you haven't got longitudinal balance, your aircraft is not at all flyable. Um, and so the center of gravity is generally positioned a little bit ahead of the center of lift. This is going back to that question earlier. Um, and that is balanced out. So if you just didn't have the tail, you would have a slight nose down pitching moment, so the weight's slightly ahead of the lift, and then you balance that with a little negative lift on the tail. Um, and what this does is it provides additional static stability. Now, 
Static stability is something that you won't learn in a lot of detail until next year. Um, but basically, if you get certain perturbations like a gust or rapid change in airspeed, the aircraft will have a tendency to self-correct if the weight is in front of the lift here. Because you've got this negative lift, if that lift disappears, the aircraft tends to nose down and become stable. If the aircraft tip nose up, you'd stall your wings and you'd, you'd fall. Whereas if your aircraft tips nose down, you can recover um, out of a gust or whatever else. So it's it's generally provides that little bit of safety and static stability. Um, but it must be kept in a in a really tight range. So if your CG moves too far behind, you don't have enough tail authority. When we say tail authority, like the amount of force that the tail can provide to keep it um, to keep the aircraft stable or if the CG is too far forward you've got insufficient negative tail authority to keep the aircraft from pitching down and diving into the ground and so there's this really quite narrow range that the CG has to be within um, an important thing here is that small variations in the CG are, are an operations problem they just make the aircraft draggier because you can trim them out and you can keep the aircraft stable and safe. But in the process of doing that, you're, you're generating more aerodynamic force and you're generating more drag. And so to keep it um, efficient, you want to keep the CG in a tight range. It, there's a bit more range that you can move in and be inefficient, but it's not unsafe. Once you get outside a certain tolerance, it's then unsafe. Isn't it also compounded because with a with an off tail, it's generating a downforce essentially, which is counting yeah. the Yeah, absolutely. Of yeah. They both generate it. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're exactly right. In this case, you're in in the standard configuration, you're generating negative lift here at the tail. Um, and that's costing you. You're putting in all this fuel and thrust to generate this. And then you're going and wiping some of it out by pushing down the other way. So you don't want that to be um, a big vector. <clears throat> um, all right. So this is an example of a pre-flight worksheet for um, a small aircraft. You will have a datum defined, some CG locations for the seats, um, CG location for the empty weight. So this is this dot here. This is the empty weight CG, CG location for the fuel tank. Um, for your cargo hold locations um, and depending on where they are like for small aircraft these will be very like 100 pounds max 60 pounds max um, this is the kind of worksheet that someone will work through when they're planning a um, small aircraft flight um, and so then you run down through the same calculation so we've got all of the weights um, the pass so that the uh, aircraft line accounts for all the stuff before you put passengers, ca uh, cargo, fuel, etc. So that's got a particular known location. Then you've got people sitting in the front seats, people sitting in the rear seats, the fuel, the baggage. And then so you can do the same calculation and work out where the CG of the aircraft is with all of the stuff in which in this case is 43.54 inches. And then you can go along to your chart and say, okay, 43.54 inches is somewhere here. My pen has decided to stop working again. Come on, wake up. Oh, there we go. No, come back, pen. No, I'm going to have to do this for a second. No, it's, it's, oh, there we go. No, it's using my finger. Okay, it'll let, let me use my finger. That'll be right. Um, and so then you can have the total weight of the aircraft, which in this case is 3,027. And so 3,027 is somewhere along there. Okay. And then, so that's the takeoff condition for the aircraft. And it has to be within that envelope. Okay. So when you're heavy, you're closer to the margins of all of your um, control surfaces and you've got less authority to fix things if if there's um, 
if there's an out of balance condition. So that's why this is narrow at the top because when your aircraft is fully laden, there's just not as much region for error. So you can see here, the CG fully laden is what, two and a bit inches range across this whole aircraft. So you're really, really tightly balancing that CG. As you get lighter, as you burn through some of your fuel and go through your mission, you get a wider range here. Okay, so they've got 88 pounds of, um, or 88 gallons, which is 528 pounds of fuel. So as they go through their mission, this will come down 500 pounds. So down to sort of here somewhere, so you get much more um, flexibility. Okay, um, and and this is obvious, like in some conditions, the aircraft, I mean, this is not saying that's how big the tank is. You, you could have some missions where you've got sm smaller number of passengers, but more fuel if you want to fly further. <clears throat> um, okay, now, have I got my pen back? No. Let's take that off. Oh, that's not happy. There we go. Um, but then we can repeat the calculation. What's the time? I think this is pretty much the last slide. So let's do this calculation. Um, the, you can repeat the calculation with um, zero fuel. So we can say, well, we started up here somewhere. Um, no, it's still not working. Okay, I'm going to work that out before Friday. Um, and then as the um, fuel burns, it's going to come down to some other location. So generally what happens is the CG of the fuel is such that as the fuel burns, the total CG of the aircraft will move um, forwards a little bit because it, it just helps balance things out. So the, the fuel will be ever so slightly behind the CG of the aircraft. And as it burns, the, C, the total overall CG moves forward. Um, and th that adds a lot of stability benefits. It means you have less load on your tail and all sorts of other things. <clears throat> now, for big aircraft, one of the major ways that they trim out imbalances or, or control things over the flight is with fuel trim. So especially with swept wing aircraft, you've got lots more CG range to move fuel around in because if this is a starting CG, if all your fuel's in your front tanks, that's moving your CG a long way forward. If all your fuel's in your, your outboard tanks, that's moving the CG back. Um, and so you've got, and some of these will have fuselage tanks back here as well, smaller ones that have got a long moment arm to give a large amount of um, ability to trim. So you can trim aerodynamically, but you can also trim with fuel. And so there's constantly calculations going on on board aircraft to kind of move fuel around to keep them all trimmed up and efficient. 